All right. So uh, this evening, we're looking at our second topic, which is the business environment. And so from our last meeting, we established what a business is or the role of business in society. And we also um, looked at um, some of the differences between an, an organization and or what an organization is and what administration and management is. So now in the context of business, uh, we want to look at the environment or the how the business actually exists within the larger environment. And so at the end of the lecture, these will be our learning outcomes. So we are expected to be able to differentiate between the types of business environment. And also we'll look at the main two types, which is the macro and the micro. And then we'll look at the three main economic systems that uh, can be found in the business environment. All right. So when we talk about the business environment, we are saying that it is those influences or those uh, factors that actually influence businesses' decisions as to what to produce, what to sell, who to employ, how and where to produce, where to go for a loan, et cetera, et cetera. So the environment within which the business exists influences the day-to-day -day decisions of the business. So for instance, what to produce and sell? Do we go into food and beverages? Do we go into manufacturing of uh, home appliances? Um, do we provide services? What kind of services? Who are our target market? Who are our customers? Which people do we employ? What should be their uh, qualification or their work background? Where do we produce? Do we produce closer to the raw materials or closer to the um, customers? And all of these uh, questions uh, are influenced by the business environment. So within the business environment, we have two main types. And for the purposes of this lecture, we have what we call the internal environment and then the external environment. The internal environment can also be referred to as the micro or the specific environment, whereas the external environment refers to the macro or the general environment. So let's look at what the business environment actually is. So this text defines the business environment as all external factors which have a bearing on the functioning of the business. It refers to those aspects of the business surroundings. It refers to those aspects of the surroundings of business enterprise and circumstances of business units which affect or influence its activities and operations and decides its effectiveness. So in a nutshell, when we talk about the business environment, we're saying that the business enterprise or the company or the firm, there are certain circumstances of the business unit which can, which affect or influence the activities and operations. And then it also affects how it decides its effectiveness. All right. So we'll look at those things into detail. But why do we even need to study the business environment? So the success of every business depends upon how the business is able to adapt itself to the environment within which it functions. So for example, when there is a change in government policies, the business has to make the necessary changes to adapt itself to the new policies. So, for example, uh, when the e-levy was introduced, it was expected that um, companies and even uh, businesses would also 
be affected, whether you were a small business, a large business, whether you were into manufacturing or service, this particular policy had an impact or an effect on businesses. We can also talk about um, some trade policies, all right, if you look at it from a, an international perspective. So there are trade policies, so trade between countries, let's say Ghana, Nigeria, Ghana, Togo, and et cetera. So when some of these uh, policies are implemented, all right, or whether there are any changes in government policies, the business would then have to make some necessary changes to be able to adapt itself to these new policies. I hope that is clear. Another example is change in technology. So uh, the introduction of colored TV replaced the black and white or the introduction of computers replaced typewriters. But now we can even go as far as saying that the introduction of um, uh, technology-based, you know, business tools, or we can look at even the internet. Now we are talking about uh, fourth generation, generation five, and, and all of that. So technically we speaking, a lot of businesses don't use typewriters anymore, though you find maybe a few people um, who still, especially when you go to the commissioner of oats and the and and the rest, but in most business and uh, uh, organizations, you would find that they will be using even these days. Most people don't even use desktop; they use tablets or they use uh, laptops. Okay, and the use of smartphones and other devices. All right. So all of these are external factors that are beyond the control of the business. So what it means is that the business cannot necessarily um, have any control or to a large extent will not be able to control these external factors, all right? So it is important for businesses to have a clear understanding of concepts of business environment in order to adapt themselves to the business environment. So now let's zoom into the internal environment. So when we talk of the internal environment, um, according to Charles Hill and Gary Jones, a company's microenvironment consists of elements that directly affect the company, such as competitors, customers, and suppliers. So the key word here is directly affects the company. So the microenvironment consists of all those factors which directly affect the business's functioning or the business's operations or its activities. So the factors include the suppliers, your competitors, your employees, your customers, your investors, stakeholders, regulating agencies, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these elements or all of these factors have a direct effect on the functioning or operations of the business. So who can tell us who our suppliers are or who are suppliers of a business? Or what role the suppliers? You may use the icon to raise Okay, I see Rosemary. Yes, Rosemary, you may speak. So, Blanche, please, please revive from the more schools to sell. I could barely hear you. It looks like your network is um, a bit unstable. The suppliers are who? They are those we buy from them. Those who produce goods and give it to people to sell. Is it just goods they we, we get from them? Okay, I see Mary. The suppliers are those who manufacture the goods and bring it out. Okay, thank you. 
So in other words, the suppliers are the people who supply the inputs or the raw materials to the business. So for example, if you are running a bakery, you would need what? What are the ingredients? You need flour, you need what? Sugar, margarine. So the people from whom you're going to buy these inputs are your what? Your suppliers. Is that okay? All right. So the suppliers are those uh, who supply the inputs in simple terms. And they hold an important value for a business because they are responsible in ensuring that uh, the business will be able to meet its business demands. So if there is a delay by the supplier, it could result in loss for the business. So let's say you are relying on your uh, supply. Let's say you operate a restaurant and you are relying on um, those who supply you the drinks and they delay and you have a let's say you have you are holding an event and then there's a delay in the supply of your drinks and all other inputs definitely when your customers come they will not be happy and that will affect even your uh your business all right so your customers may end up switching to another uh, competitor or a nearby available uh, you know food restaurant just because you are unable to meet their demands all right then we have the customers who are our customers those whose network is unstable what you can do is that you can send a chat somebody says the line is not clear is it clearer now is the line clearer now Douna, a little. Uh, probably is your network. Anybody else not having a clear audio? Okay. For the sake of time, let's move on. All right. So the customers are our, uh, those who patronize our goods and services, right? And they are very important for the success of the business. So a business is very much influenced by the customer's taste and preferences. And so as a business, it is important to take into account the taste and preference of the customers. So let's say you are a service provider and you are in the provision of um, financial services, let's say, you're a financial service provider or an insurance company. You have different category of customers. Some are aged, some are working class, some are young students, some are young people, and they have different needs. Okay, so you cannot design a one fit insurance policy or banking solutions for all of them, you know, group together you need to make sure that you are able to design or customize your service to suit the individual taste and preferences of your customers. So if you look at, for instance, those who prefer Apple phones to Android phones, there's a reason why, is there a hand up? Okay. There's a reason why some customers prefer Apple phones to Android phones, okay? Some talk about security features, others talk about uh, camera quality, et cetera, et cetera. So customers have different tastes and preferences. And so as a business, you must take into account the taste and preferences of your customers. So how do you think the customers can affect the business or the operations of a business? Anybody would like Hello. to try? Yes. Hello. Who do I have? Please. Abigail. Abigail. Okay. Customers can affect the business by not patronizing or purchasing the products anymore. Okay. Why would they not do that? Or why would they choose not to patronize your 
your service or your business? Because of the taste or there's a change in price or taste and preference. Okay. All right. That is correct. Anyone else? Okay, I see Rosemary. Hello. Is okay, that Rosemary? So okay. Please, customers can affect the business positively and negatively. All right. They can make the business grow and also they can make the business collapse. How? That is... Okay, for them making the business grow is when there is intensive advertisement and also price are low and they are able to meet their demand. It makes the business grow. Okay. But if, like what Abigail says, it makes the business collapse or something. Or decline in business, in sales or decline in, in growth. All right. Okay. Yes. I heard another voice. Uh, somebody was trying to also... Okay, but I don't see any other hands raised. All right. Thank you for your input. So let's move on to the next. We have competitors. So who are the competitors? Who are the competitors of uh, business? Yes, Emma. Or is it Emma? Yeah, you are. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The people you find yourself in the same business with. All right, that's correct. All right, that's okay, so competitors are those who uh, make similar products or offer similar services, okay, in the same market with the business. All right, so when you were um, applying to GCT, I'm sure there were other universities that you you had in mind. Okay, Edu Prince says MTN competing with Vodafone is an example. Thank you for that. So those other businesses who are offering the same or similar services in the same market with their business, okay? So the actions of the other com competitors will affect the level of output of the business positively or negatively. So you realize that competitors also play an important role for a business. And so if you're a business, you need to carefully analyze your competitor strategies so that you can develop counter strategies and deal with the competition well, all right? So it is important that a business understands uh, these elements or these factors in the internal environment. Then we can also talk about your employees. So we all know that the employees are those who help a business to be able to produce their goods and services to meet the demand of their customers. And so the survival of any business organization highly depends on its workers. And so the workers need to be given the necessary uh, motivational needs, okay? Because when you motivate them well in terms of uh, uh, good wages or salaries, uh, benefits and, and what have you, it will induce them to put more effort into increasing output. So employees are responsible for production of quality goods and offering quality services. So if a business fails or manages, manages fails to manage its employees well, and they are not able to keep the employees satisfied. That is what will result in strike actions and lockouts. And we have a lot of examples of uh, instances where uh, there have been labor unrest. Uh, popular ones in Ghana is when Utah goes on strike or doctors or medical professionals goes. And recently it is, judi uh, is it judiciary staff, right, administrators or so, they've also gone on strike, all because of they are not satisfied with, you know, uh, conditions of service and all of that. And so your employees are a very critical element in the business's survival. And so as a business owner, a business person or manager, you need to ensure that you manage your employees well, 
keep them satisfied so that they can also put in a maximum effort to ensure that there is increase in work output. Then we have regulating agencies. So these are government agencies responsible for implementing rules and laws that are related to the business. And they ensure that a business abides by all the laws of the states. So can we mention a few of these regulating agencies? Those government agencies that regulate the operations of businesses. Okay, FDA, thank you, Christopher. That's Food and Drugs Authority. Any other? Okay, AMA, SEC. Uh, SEC is what? The Securities Exchange Commission, right? Okay. All right, thank you for those uh, examples. Okay, Jer Jerome, okay. Your hand is up. You can unmute and speak. Um Yes, Ghana Revenue Authority, they too. Yes, Ghana Revenue Authority. I'm seeing uh, GSA, Ghana Standards Authority, National Accreditation, Bank of Ghana. Excellent. Customs. Customs. Yeah, customs. yeah they fall under GRA. Yeah, but that, that is okay. also correct. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we see the role that all of these agencies play. They ensure that their business abides by the laws of the state. So that is their, their, their role. And so they also are important. And so when they also implement or they bring in any new laws or rules related to the business, it can influence or affect how the businesses operate. All right. Then we have investors and um, stakeholders. So investors and stakeholders, they closely monitor each and every activity of the business. Uh, those who were in class on Saturday, remember I mentioned that we have shareholders, okay? So indirectly, shareholders, they are the ones who invest uh, in the business. So they have invested capital or money, or some of them have invested resources, and they are expecting returns on their investment. And so they keep a close eye on the operations and activities of the business. And so in order for the business or the firm to function properly, it needs investors. It needs investors. And then these investors are also monitoring the activities to ensure that the decisions that the business is taking is in their interest, all right? So that they can gain, you know, Oh, my apologies. Uh, my network is quite unstable. I think I need to switch to another network. Uh, my Wi-Fi has been quite unstable. I apologize for that. Okay, so are we all here now? Okay, you would have to yes, log in. All right, so apologies for that. So let me continue from where I left off. Okay, is my screen visible? It's a no, please. It's visible now. It's visible now, okay. Let me put it in presentation mode. All right, so... A moment, let me just start recording. Okay, it's still recording anyway. All right, so it's important that we pay attention to these investors and, their, and the stakeholders. They are those who have an interest or who have a stake uh, in the business. It's important as a business, we pay attention to these uh, uh, groups of people. All right. Any questions before we move to the external environment? I don't see any hands, no chats. Okay, so let me quickly move on to the external environment. So the external environment, also known as the macro or the general environment, 
includes all those factors which indirectly influence the business. So you see that the opposite of the internal environment is the external. And I mentioned that for the internal environment, those factors which directly affect the business is what we refer to as the internal. But for the external, the factors affect the business indirectly. So what it means is that the business doesn't have much control, all right? The business cannot really uh, control how these factors influence it. So we have the political environment, we have the economic environment, social cultural environment, technological, global, or the international environment, and then demographics. So we'll look at them in a bit. So let's look at the political environment. So with the political environment, also termed legal environment, uh, this is the system or uh, maybe we call it a government system that uh, affects the businesses' operations. So in Ghana, for instance, we have three arms of government, right? We have the legislative that is responsible for making the laws, that is the parliamentarians. We have the executive responsible for implementing these laws. And then we have the judiciary, uh, which enforces the laws. So every business needs to know its political environment well in order to abide by the rules and laws of the land. So if you are an international business and you want to operate in Ghana, you need to know what the business laws or what the, the laws of the land are in respect of your business. Because there's a saying that ignorance of the law is not an excuse, all right? So it's important to know what the political environment entails so that you can abide by all the rules and laws of the land. We can talk about contract laws, so businesses, when they are entering into uh, agreements, okay, so if you're a business and you are bidding for a government uh, contract, uh, you need to understand what these laws, some of them might be technical, so you might have to get a legal person to explain some of these uh, laws. And uh, we have the taxes and regulation. So in Ghana, we can all think of uh, so many taxes. Oh, my microphone went off. Is that so? Am I audible now? Duke, I'm told that my microphone went off. But is it on now? Yes, Hello? it's on now. All right, thank it's you. Better. Yeah. It's better now. All right. So taxes, for instance, we, we can talk of so many taxes uh, that, that are, you know, the most popular one is the e-levy, which a lot of people are not happy about, but, well, it has come to stay. And other regulations, okay. Now let's look at the economic environment. We can uh, describe it as all those economic factors, uh, which has an indirect effect on the business, all right? So the business has to keep in mind all the economic constraints and the economic systems that uh, exist, all right? So this includes the economic systems, whether it's a socialist system, capitalist system, or mixed economy, the economic condition itself, whether there is high inflation or deflation. I don't remember the last time Ghana had deflation, but uh, we've all been witnesses to the inf high inflation rates. Uh, the economic growth, where we talk about GDP and the rest. Economic policies, so fiscal policies, monetary policies, etc. Exchange rates and interest rates, all of these have, you know, an effect. So for instance, if we take exchange rates, how can exchange rates affect uh, the activities of a business? Anybody want to try answering that? 
exchange rates. Madam, please, you said. Pardon me. Hello. I thought somebody Hello. was speaking. Yes. I'm asking, how do you think exchange rates can influence a business's operation? Okay, yeah, you are. Um, please, it can affect the cost of production or cost of raw materials, especially when um, we need to import the raw materials. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, somebody is saying when a foreign currency is highly purchased, yes. Uh, Ukraine-Russia conflict has caused deflation. Okay. And that one is quite debatable. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? From here to Tuesday. No one, no one. Okay, Mary. Madam, please, when the inflation is high. Okay, what happens when inflation is high? The cost of raw material can reduce for the production. The cost of raw materials can reduce or... So Increase. increase 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 in the production okay mm. so the cost of of production will increase so when we say inflation inflation is what what is inflation is the continuous when prices mm -hmm. are going high. good when so, prices are going high. exactly so when there's a continuous rise in prices so when there is high inflation, businesses would have to use uh, more, spend more on purchasing raw materials. And that would translate into high production costs, which will affect the final product price of the product. Okay. And when the product, the price of the product is high, customers might not be able to what? To purchase, especially if it's a low-income country. Okay. So what about... Um, um okay i talked about interest rate so interest rate is basically when the lending rates of banks okay banks lending rates are high okay so if you are going to take a loan and the interest rate is so high it means that you're going to spend the the time that you've taken the the, the tenure if you have taken the loan for 3 years to be paying off the loan at a very high rate which can have diverse effect on your business okay all right so let's move on to the social cultural environment so the social cultural environment includes the social status and the class system so social status here we can talk about uh, lower lower income uh, or lower class middle class, high class. Um, so these are uh, systems that have been, um, well, I have my own reservations, but uh, uh, when you look at uh, the way the economic systems have been divided, there is what we call divisions, okay, based on classes. So there are some people who, for instance, if we take Accra, uh, even when we look at our housing systems, there are people who live in high class areas, okay, or high residential areas, those who live in middle class and those who live in low class, okay. So as, as a business, if you find yourself in an environment where majority of the population are in the lower class, then that would in, uh, uh, send a signal or indication as to what kind of even business to uh, pursue. So for the low class, 
they, they would want to buy basic necessities like food, clothing, shelter. And so you cannot go into, let's say, production of luxury goods. Okay, but if you are in an environment where, let's say, a larger percentage of the population are in the middle class and high class, then that will also be an indicator to the business as to even the kind of products or services to do what? To provide. Then the religious beliefs. So um, Ghana is said to be a secular state, right? But uh, uh, according to statistics, the percentage of uh, Christians is higher. Then we followed by, I think, the Islam and then traditional religion. So religious beliefs. So people uh, have various religious beliefs. So for instance, if it's a Jewish community and you are into a pork business or if it's an Islamic community and you want to go into pork business, there is no way you're going to get people to patronize your business because per their religious beliefs, pork is a dirty animal and their religion abhors eating pork. All right. So the religious beliefs. So for instance, if you go to most Arab countries, they don't work on Fridays because... Uh, Fridays are meant for them to worship. So Fridays and Saturdays are like weekends and Sunday to Thursday is a working day. So all of these factors, you know, uh, must also be taken into consideration. The linguistic base, so the language, you know, diversity in race, uh, racial diversity, social evils. So social evils here talks about some of the... Um, um this how do i put it so for instance now there's this uh issue of um cyber crime there's a lot of people who are scamming people on the internet you know all of these social ills or social evils you know so as a business you need to be well versed with the social cultural environment because it decides the taste and preferences of the business and that can go a long way to create either opportunities or threats uh, for your business. Okay, so when we look at this diagram, you see that we have diversity in terms of the culture. So for instance, if you take a state, a country like the United States of America, there is a diverse, you know, uh, culture. You have the uh, Asian community, you have the Black American, you have the Hispanics, you have so all of these dynamics, you know, can affect the business. Um, we can talk about the aging and uh, grain of Ghana. So, um, because of a lot of um success, or uh, now we look at the 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 way medicine has advanced, uh, a lot of people are living longer. All right, so we have a lot of uh let me call them senior citizens, okay? Those who have gone on retirement and are still, you know, on pension. So these are also factors to consider. Uh, two income families. So when you have a two income family, it means that they are, um, they, they have uh, the ability to purchase more or their disposable income is higher as compared to a single parent family. Okay, where you have a single mother or a single father taking care of maybe two, three children. So a two-income family will have a higher disposable income to be able to purchase, you know, more. Then we can also talk about technology. Uh, so it is the most dynamic, you know, environment of the business because things keep changing rapidly. So uh, you can talk about how technology has uh, swiftly change the way we compete. So when COVID came, we all saw how companies that were technology oriented, you know, were still thriving. Businesses that were uh, using more technology. Technology here is not just the internet or uh, e-commerce, but even the, the ability to use uh, innovation, all right, creativity to come up with new way of doing things or do, doing business. Okay, so during the lockdown, you realize that those who were in the uh, curia and uh, 
delivery, service delivery, they were really doing a lot of business because you couldn't go out. So we all needed to either rely on delivery and courier services. All right. So all of these technological factors. Uh, okay. Thank you, Prince. So he said that uh, Zipline uh, used drones to transport medicines to villages. Yes. And I think I even heard about, uh, is it blood? Uh, I don't know whether that's true, but I think I heard something like that. All right. So drones were used to supply uh, medicine and, you know, to remote areas. So the the, the role of technology is, is cannot be, uh, uh, I mean, and I emphasize. So we can talk about the internet, electronic commerce, uh, the role of intermediaries, uh, responsiveness to customers, information, all of these are within the technological environment and they go a long way to affect the business. All right. Then the demographic environment, here we are just referring to the population of a country, the literacy rates, the birth and death rate, the age classes, the standard of living. So if the population is such that a larger percentage of the population are within the uh, youthful age. So in Ghana, we are told that a larger percentage are within the youthful age. So we realize that a lot of the unemployment is because a lot of young people fall in that bracket, okay? Because these are the people who should be actively employed and be working, but unfortunately, they they, they cannot find jobs. And the literacy rate. So if you have a high literacy rate, it will translate into, you know, higher production, uh, quality of service and all of that. Uh, the birth and death rates can also affect, you know, businesses, the age classes, and also the standard of living. So as a business, you should understand your demographic environment, all right, so that you can be able to adjust and meet the demands well, all right, according to the demand of the population. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, then lastly, we can talk about the global environment, which is the, the bigger, uh, you know, international environment. So we can talk about quality. So quality here is just... Uh, so quality means different things to different people, all right? So the world is gearing towards clean, you know, energy production and what have you. And so a lot of businesses are advocating for ensuring that we use less raw material so that we can protect Mother Earth, making sure that uh, businesses employ the best uh, methods to ensure that the, they don't waste uh, raw materials and we ensure that we also uh, do more of green production. Green production here is just talking about ensuring that we use the best uh, health methods or health in terms of health and all of that. Uh, increase in productivity and a lot of changes uh, now because of uh, the advocacy for ensuring that we protect the climate. Uh, climate change and all of those, you know, discussions and conversations surrounding uh, protection of the Mother Earth. All right. Any questions so far? I don't see any hands. I don't see any chats. Okay. Oh, some people are dropping in and out. I think the network, but I'm recording, so I'll make the recording available. Uh, can you give me a moment to just uh, get some water? I'll be right back. Okay, man. All right, so 
we can continue now. So now we want to look at the last objective or learning outcome, which is the economic systems. So when we talk about the economic systems, basically it is the, the economy, okay? Or the type of uh, economy that countries um, or uh, 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 when we look at the country in question, what kind of economic system it is that they operate under. And so we can talk about three main types. So we have uh, communism, we have socialism, and then we have capitalism. But in between socialism and capitalism, we have the mixed economic system. All right. So in a nutshell, the communist system is highly controlled where uh, it's a centralized and planned system. Whereas the capitalism, there is little control by government. And then uh, individuals, you know, are the ones who own and uh, operate resources and all of that. So we'll look at them into detail. So the first one is capitalism. And here we have the uh, US flag in the sense that it's a capitalist state. So one of the characteristics of capitalism is that pro property is privately owned or individuals are allowed to own property, okay? And there is what we call profits or ownership. So if you are running a business, you own a business, you own it and you own, you know, you take your um, profits, okay? There is freedom of competition, healthy competition, though sometimes there might be in, uh, incidents of uh, unhealthy competition. But as much as possible, there should be healthy competition. All right. Then we have um, freedom of choice, freedom of choice. So you are allowed to, um, you know, be in whatever association or what society and all of that. Uh, unfortunately, that is why we have the problem of all the the LGBTQ and all the, you know, those things. But I, I wouldn't want to go into that. Uh, Rhoda says my screen is dark. Is that so? No, we can see. You can see. Then Rhoda probably should check your yeah. screen lights. You should check your screen lights. All right. Thank you. So there is freedom of choice. Uh, you can choose the religion you want to belong to. You can choose the associations you want to be and all of that. Okay. Then there is also free market, what we call the free economy. Okay. Or the French will say les effets. Okay. So when you see les effets or you hear les effets, it's talking about capitalism or what we call the free market economy. Okay. So free market in the sense that there's that freedom to do. So if you are interested in, in, in starting uh, any kind of business, you, you have the, you're at liberty, okay? Provided that you fall within the laws of the state or the country, okay? Then we have communism or communism. So here we have almighty North Korea. Okay, so communist states are known as those who have a high control of government or the government influences most of the decisions. So there's public ownership of property and resources. So individuals do not uh, directly own resources, okay, and capital and all of that. There is central planning or what we call a controlled economy. So countries like China, uh, North Korea, um, and the rest, okay? So the government that is in power is the one that plans, that controls the economy, how resources are allocated and et cetera. And there is what they call mandatory party membership. So everybody must belong to that party and it is final. Uh, we are not here to discuss the 
benefits and the or the advantages and disadvantages. But I'm just uh, sharing with you the characteristics or the how these economic systems look like. Then we have socialism. Okay, so in socialism, uh, there is both private and public ownership of resources. Okay, so uh, there are some resources that the states will take control of, and there are others that you know individuals are allowed. So, for instance, when it comes to health, delivery, education, those key things, the states, you know, takes control. So, countries like Scandinavia. So, we have the Swedish flag here. So, for instance, they have systems where uh, there is free tuition for children from, you know tertiary level and then from uh, basic school to high school, they have system in place to ensure that everybody benefits from health, you know, care and all of that. So that is why some choices are limited and it creates what they call social equality and uh, equality of results. So if you check the um, social index of such countries, you see that they have very high quality a, a standard of living they focus more on the quality of life okay however the downside is that sometimes these type of systems reduces uh, individual incentive and so sometimes people take advantage of these systems and they so for instance if you're unemployed the state takes care of you or there are uh, uh, policies and incentives to cater for people who are unemployed. And sometimes people take advantage of the system. And so it reduces um, individual incentive. <clears throat> then we have the, <clears throat> sorry, the last of which is the mixed economies. So we have the uh, command economy, uh, whereby we have uh, both uh, a bit of socialism and communism. So this particular trend results in a blend, okay? There is a blend. So we can have a system where we have uh, capitalism being greater than socialism or socialism being greater than capitalism. So what it means is that the blend varies. So you can have more of capitalism and a bit of socialism, or you can have more of socialism as against uh, capitalism. Uh, countries who practice this, um, uh, none comes to mind, but you can do a search online. I'm sure you find a number of them. Okay. Any questions on the economic systems? <clears throat> so Ghana, which, which economic system do you think Ghana is practicing? Which one do we think? Are we a socialist state, communist, or capitalist? Anybody? Okay, somebody says socialism. Rosemary, are you sure? I can say hello. Hey. If you are not on the floor, please mute your microphone. Um, who is speaking? Abigail. Abigail, okay. They say Ghana, we practice more of um, communism um, um, system because most of uh, this thing is being owned by the individuals. Oh, uh, then you've you've mixed up the explanation. Communist states don't individuals don't own resources; it is publicly owned. It is the capitalist system where individuals are allowed to own and control resources. Have you gotten the distinction now? Yes, yes, me. Sorry. Okay, it's capitalist. So Ghana practices which economic system? Capital. Capitalism. Capitalism. Okay. 
Some say mixed, mm -hmm. some say mixed. Okay. So uh, maybe I'll give that to you as an assignment. And then when we meet on Saturday, we'll see those who would win the day. <laughs> All right. So for the sake of time, let me just go to the last bit, which is market structures. So market structures, here we are looking at uh, the various type of market st uh, structures that exist within the business environment. So we can have various, um, what do you call it, types. So we'll look at the monopoly, we'll look at the oligopoly, we'll look at the monopolistic competition and pure competition. So there are uh, four main types. <clears throat> so it is just looking at the degree of competition or the extent to which competition exists in the in the economic system or within the business environment. So if you look at the scale uh, that is here, we, we have where we have only one uh, provider of the service as against many, but let's look at them briefly. So we have the monopoly. So monopoly is one seller of a unique what? Product or service. So we have uh, those who are into diamond production and utilities, okay, like the Ghana Water Company, ECG. So these companies, they set the price. So when public utilities uh, uh, regulation commission or PURC, when they set the price for water, that is final. Nobody else can <laughs> challenge or question it, all right? Though people would, uh, you know, speak against it and all that, they set the price. So there's only one provider of the service or one producer of the product. Then we have ol oligopoly, where we have few sellers of different products or services. So, for instance, uh, tobacco and uh, automobiles, okay? So here there is no price competition per se. Okay, there is no price competition. So if you look at the automobile industry, uh, here in Ghana, we, we can't talk of too many. Uh, Kantanka so far is the only indigenous uh, provider, but we can talk of Toyota. Uh, Toyota can talk of... Um, so you see that Toyota vehicles, if it's a Toyota salon, you know, the prices, yes. This, the line is breaking. Oh, sorry. Is it better now? I'm told my internet is unstable. I don't know what's happening to Please, can you repeat what you said? Is the line better now? Am I more no, audible? Madam. Am I more? Yes, please. Yes, it's better, but, but please, can you repeat what you said? Okay, so for oligopoly, Madam, please, if you... for oligopoly, what I'm saying is that we have just few sellers, okay, of different products. So for instance, if you take Toyota, Toyota Camp, uh, Automobile, all right, they, they produce different, uh, should I call it uh, brands or different types of Toyota cars. So they have the saloon cars, they have the four wheel drives, they have the, uh, pickups and the SUVs and the rest, okay? So there is no price competition per se, okay? Then if you look at the tobacco industry, uh, we have different, different uh, sellers. Sorry, few sellers, but with different products or services, okay? So that's just an example I'm giving. Is that okay now? I hope my line yes, is better madam. now. Okay. Yes, please. All right. Yes, ma yes, madam. All right. Then we have the monopolistic competition where we have many sellers with different, uh, where we have perceived differences. Okay. Many sellers with perceived differences. So fast food and tertiary institutions. So when we look at the fast food industry, 
there are so many sellers. We can talk of KFC, Papaya. Uh, we can talk about all the fast food joints, you know. But it's because that the customers have perceived differences. So if you look at uh, most of this pizza, uh, what do you call it? Hats. It's the same pizza, but people have perceived differences that, okay, a particular pizza has more taste or preferred taste and all of that. The same applies to tertiary institutions. We have so many tertiary institutions, but we have perceived differences. So why didn't any of you choose to go to any of the other public institutions or even the private ones? Because you had maybe different uh, perception in terms of maybe the costs, institutions, and all of that. And so within a monopolistic competition, we have many sellers providing the service or the product, but there are perceived differences among them. Then we have the perfect or the pure competition. So with the perfect competition, we have many sellers and many buyers, many sellers and many buyers. So we can talk about the uh, beverages and uh, mineral water. We have so many of them. Okay, so there are some limitations of the free market. So there is inequality of wealth. Uh, so with the free market, because it's more of a capitalist state, uh, it's more or less survival of the fittest. And so there is inequality of wealth caused by national and world tension. So if you look at the, the trade war between China and USA, it's all because every each of them wants to be a superpower. And so sometimes it might lead to exploitation of resources causing potential damage to the environment. Look at what is happening to our water bodies in Ghana. Illegal mining, the popular kalamse and all of that. And then limitations can put, push the country towards socialism where there will be government regulation. So... These are the key words from today's lecture. We've looked at the business environment. We've said that there are two main factors or the two main environments. We have the external and the internal. We've looked at the elements within each environment. And we've seen how these elements or these factors can affect the business. The internal ones affect the business directly and the external factors affect the business indirectly. We looked at the economic systems, the capitalism, communism, socialism, and the mixed system, and then the market structures, the four market structures. So ladies and gentlemen, this is where we would end tonight's uh, lecture. So let me stop recording. So I'll open the 